This was surprising to me. So much work, energy, and time has gone into creating a trustless distributed consensus mechanism. But virtually all clients that wish to access it do so by simply trusting the outputs from these two companies without any further verification. Hello and welcome to Ethereum Audible, Ethereum In-Depth, where we read the best in Ethereum and the Web3 ecosystem. I'm Yushua Zlatogorsky, and we are going to be continuing our exploration of why Web3 and Ethereum is important, what crypto brings to the table. Last week, we read DHH's and Punk 6529's take on what crypto brings to the table in terms of the freedom to transact and why it's so important. Today, we're going to be flipping the side and we're going to be taking a bearish look on the first impressions of Moxie, who is the founder of Signal, the communication messaging app, and his first impressions of Web3 and the problems that he's found. Um, really important to read the other side of the table, so to say, and get a point of view from other people on the ecosystem. At the end, I'm also going to be sharing my thoughts kind of on what I think is right and wrong in this article. Um, and next week, doing a much longer breakdown of what my personal opinion in, is on what Web3 brings to the table. But first, today we will be reading my first impressions of Web3 by Moxie. Before we dive into that, just want to give a shout out to Alp Audio for sponsoring and helping get Ethereum Audible out the door. Alp Audio, A-L-P-E, is a audio course platform where you can find and learn courses on the go through audio wherever you want, whenever you can, whenever you have the time, screen free, with all the bells and whistles that you would expect from an audio course. Basically, imagine a podcast on steroids, where every lesson has summaries, flashcards, chapters, further resources that you can explore all in your pocket, with the idea of really providing uh, professionals the ability to master a topic in depth from A to Z in the time that they have. So thank you to Alb Audio for sponsoring Ethereum Audible. And with that, let's go. My first impressions of Web3 from January 7th, 2022. Despite considering myself a cryptographer, I have not found myself particularly drawn to crypto. I don't think I've ever actually said the words, get off my lawn, but I'm much more likely to click on Pepperidge Farm Remembers flavored memes about how crypto used to mean cryptography than I am the latest NFT drop. Also, cards on the table here, I don't share the same generational excitement for moving all aspects of life into an instrumented economy. Even strictly on the technological level, though I haven't yet managed to become a believer, so given all of the recent attention into what is now being called Web3, I decided to explore some of what has been happening in that space more thoroughly to see what I may be missing. How I think about 1 and 2. Web3 is a somewhat ambiguous term, which makes it difficult to rigorously evaluate what the ambitions for Web3 should be. But the general thesis seems to be that Web1 was decentralized, Web2 centralized everything into platforms, and that Web3 will decentralize everything again. Web3 should give us the richness of Web2, but decentralized. It's probably good to have some clarity on why centralized platforms emerge to begin with, and in my mind the explanation is pretty simple. 1. People don't want to run their own servers, and never will. The premise for Web1 was that everyone on the internet would be both a publisher and consumer of content, as well as a publisher and consumer of infrastructure. We'd all have our own web servers with our own website our own mail server for our own email, our own finger server for our own status messages, our own Chargon server for our own character generation. However, and I don't think this can be emphasized enough, that is not what people want. People do not want to run their own servers. Even nerds do not want to run their own servers at this point. Even organizations building software full-time do not want to run their own servers at this point. 
if there's one thing I hope we've learned about the world, it's that people do not want to run their own servers. The companies that emerged offering to do that for you instead were successful. And the companies that iterated on new functionality based on what is possible with those networks were even more successful. Two, a protocol moves much more slowly than a platform. After 30 plus years, email is still unencrypted. Meanwhile, WhatsApp went from unencrypted to full end-to-end -end encryption in a year. People are still trying to standardize sharing a video reliably over IRC. Meanwhile, Slack lets you create custom reaction emojis based on your face. This isn't a funding issue. If something is truly decentralized, it becomes very difficult to change and often remains stuck in time. That is probably a problem for technology because the rest of the ecosystem is moving very quickly. And if you don't keep up, you will fail. There are entire parallel industries focused on defining and improving methodologies like agile to try to figure out how to organize enormous groups of people so that they can move as quickly as possible because it is so critical. When the technology itself is more conducive to status than movement, that's a problem. A sure recipe for success has been to take a 90s protocol that was stuck in time, centralize it, and iterate quickly. But Web3 intends to be different. So let's take a look. In order to get a quick feeling for the space and a better understanding for what the future may hold, I decided to build a couple of dApps and create an NFT making some distributed apps. To get a feeling for the Web3 world, I made a dApp called Autonomous Art that lets anyone mint a token for an NFT by making a visual contribution to it. The cost of making a visual contribution increases over time, and the funds a contributor pays to mint are distributed to all previous artists. Visualizing this financial structure would resemble something similar to a pyramid scheme. At the same time of this writing, over $38,000 has gone into creating this collective art piece. I also made a dApp called First Derivative that allows you to create, discover, and exchange NFT derivatives which track an underlying NFT, similar to financial derivatives which track an underlying asset. Both gave me a feeling for how the space works. To be clear, there's nothing particularly distributed about the apps themselves, they're just normal React websites. The distributedness refers to where the state and the logic and permissions for updating the state lives, which is on the blockchain instead of on a centralized database. One thing that has always felt strange to me about the cryptocurrency world is the lack of attention to the client-server interface. When people talk about blockchains, they talk about distributed trust, leaderless consensus, and all the mechanics of how that works but often gloss over the reality that clients ultimately can't participate in those mechanics. All the network diagrams are of servers, the trust model is between servers, and everything is about servers. Blockchains are designed to be a network of peers, but not designed such that it's really possible for your mobile device or your browser to be one of those peers. With the shift to mobile, we now live firmly in a world of clients and servers. With the former, completely unable to act as the latter, and those questions seem more important to me than ever. Meanwhile, Ethereum actually refers to servers as clients, so there's not even a word for an actual untrusted client-server interface that will have to exist somewhere, and no acknowledgement that if successful, there will ultimately be billions more clients than servers. For example, whether it's running on mobile or the web, a dApp like Autonomous Art or First Derivative needs to interact with the blockchain somehow in order to modify or render state, the collectively produced work of art, the edit history for it, or the NFT derivatives. That's not really possible to do from the client though, since the blockchain can't live on your mobile device or in your desktop browser realistically, so the only alternative is to interact with the blockchain via a node that's running remotely on a server somewhere. A server! But as we know, people don't want to run their own servers. As it happens, companies have emerged that sell API access to an Ethereum node they run as a service, along with providing analytics, enhanced APIs they build on top of the default Ethereum APIs, and access to historical transactions, which sounds familiar. At this point, there are basically two companies. Almost all dApps use either Infura or Alchemy in order to interact with the blockchain. In fact, even when you connect a wallet like MetaMask to a dApp, 
and the dApp interacts with the blockchain via your wallet, MetaMask is just making calls to Infura. These client APIs are not using anything to verify blockchain state or the authenticity of responses. The results aren't even signed. An app like Autonomous Art says, hey, what's the output of this view function on this smart contract? Alchemy or Infura responds with a JSON blob that says this is the output, and the app renders it. This was surprising to me. So much work, energy, and time has gone into creating a trustless distributed consensus mechanism. But virtually all clients that wish to access it do so by simply trusting the outputs from these two companies without any further verification it also doesn't seem like the best privacy situation. Imagine if every time you interacted with a website in Chrome, your request first went to Google before being routed to the destination and back. That's the situation with Ethereum today. All write traffic is obviously already public on the blockchain, but those companies also have visibility into almost all read requests from almost all users in almost all dApps. Partisans of the blockchain might say that it's okay, if these types of centralized platforms emerge, because the state itself is available on the blockchain. So if these platforms misbehave, clients can simply move elsewhere. However, I would suggest that this is a very simplistic view of the dynamics that make platforms the way they are. Let me give you an example. Making an NFT. I also wanted to create a more traditional NFT. Most people think of images and digital art when they think of NFTs, but NFTs generally do not store that data on chain. For most NFTs of most images, that would be much too expensive. Instead of storing the data on-chain, NFTs instead control a URL that points to the data. What surprised me about the standards was that there's no hash commitment for the data located at the URL. Looking at many of the NFTs on popular marketplaces being sold for tens, hundreds, or millions of dollars, that URL often just points to some VPS running Apache somewhere. Anyone with the access to that machine Anyone who buys that domain name in the future, or anyone who compromises that machine can change the image, title, description, or whatever, for the NFT, to whatever they'd like at any time, regardless of whether or not they own the token. There's nothing in the NFT spec that tells you what the image should be, or even allows you to confirm whether something is the correct image. So as an experiment, I made an NFT that changes based on who is looking at it. Since the web server that serves the image can choose to serve different images based on the IP or user agent of the requester. For example, it looked one way on OpenSea, another way on Rarible. When you buy it and view it from your crypto wallet, it will always display as a large shit emoji. What you bid on isn't what you get. There's nothing unusual about this NFT. It's how the NFT specifications are built. Many of the highest priced NFTs could turn into shit emojis at any time. I just made it explicit. After a few days without warning or explanation, the NFT I made was removed from OpenSea, which is an NFT marketplace. The takedown suggested that I violated some term of service, but after reading the terms, I don't see any that prohibit an NFT which changes based on where it is being looked at from, and I was openly describing it that way. What I found most interesting though, is that after OpenSea removed my NFT, it also no longer appeared in any crypto wallet on my device. This is Web3 though, how is that possible? A crypto wallet like MetaMask or Rainbow is non-custodial, as in the keys are kept client-side, but it has the same problem as my dApps above. A wallet has to run on a mobile device or in your browser. Meanwhile, Ethereum and other blockchains have been designed with the idea that it's a network of peers, but not designed such that it's really possible for your mobile device or your browser to be one of those peers. A wallet like MetaMask needs to do basic things like display your balance, your recent transactions, and your NFTs, as well as more complex things like constructing transactions, interacting with smart contracts, etc. In short, MetaMask needs to interact with the blockchain, but the blockchain has been built such that clients like MetaMask can't interact with it. So like my dApp, MetaMask accomplishes this by making API calls to three companies that have consolidated this space. For instance, MetaMask displays your recent transactions by making an API call to Etherscan. It displays your account balance by making an API call to Infura, and it displays your NFT by making an API call to OpenSea. Again, like with my dApp, those responses are not authenticated in some way, 
They're not even signed so that you could later prove they were lying. It reuses the same connections, TLS sessions, tickets, and etc. for all the accounts in your wallet. So if you're managing multiple accounts in your wallet to maintain some identity separation, these companies know they're linked. MetaMask doesn't actually do much. It's just a view onto data provided by these centralized APIs. This isn't a problem specific to MetaMask. What other options do they have? Rainbow are set up in exactly the same way. Interestingly, Rainbow has their own data for the social features they're building into their wallet, like a social graph and showcases, and have chosen to build all of that on top of Firebase instead of the blockchain. All this means is that if your NFT is removed from OpenSea, it also disappears from your wallet. It doesn't functionally matter that my NFT is indelibly on the blockchain somewhere because the wallet and increasingly everything else in the ecosystem is just using the OpenSea API to display NFTs, which began returning 304 no content for the query of NFTs owned by my address. Recreating this world. Given the history of why Web 1 became Web 2, what seems strange to me about Web 3 is that technologies like Ethereum have been built with many of the same implicit trappings as Web 1. To make these technologies usable, the space is consolidating around platforms. Again, people who will run servers for you and iterate on the new functionality that emerges, Infura, OpenSea, Coinbase, or Etherscan. Likewise, the Web3 protocols are slow to evolve. When building first derivative, it would have been great to price minting derivatives as a percentage of the underlying's value. That data isn't on-chain, but it's an API that OpenSea will give you. People are excited about NFT royalties for the way that they can benefit creators, but royalties aren't specified in ERC721, and it's too late to change that. So OpenSea has its own way of configuring royalties that exists in Web2 space. Iterating quickly on centralized platforms is already outpacing the distributed protocols and consolidating control into platforms. Given those dynamics, I don't think it should be a surprise that we're already at a place where your crypto wallet's view of your NFTs is OpenSea's view of your NFTs. I don't think we should be surprised that OpenSea isn't a pure view that can be replaced, since it has been busy iterating the platform beyond what is possible, strictly with the impossible to difficult to change standards. I think this is very similar to the situation with email. I can run my own mail server, but it doesn't functionally matter for privacy, censorship, resistance, or control, because Gmail is going to be on the other end of every email that I send or receive anyway. Once a distributed ecosystem centralizes around a platform for convenience, it becomes the worst of both worlds. Centralized control, but still distributed enough to become mired in time. I can build my own NFT marketplace, but it doesn't offer any additional control if OpenSea mediates the view of all NFTs in the wallet people use, and every other app in the ecosystem. This isn't a complaint about OpenSea or an indictment of what they've built, just the opposite. They're trying to build something that works. I think we should expect this kind of platform consolidation to happen, and given the inevitability, design systems that give us what we want when that's how things are organized. My sense and concern, though, is that the Web3 community expects some other outcome than what we're already seeing. It's early days. It's early days still is the most common refrain I see from people in the Web3 space when discussing matters like these. In some ways, cryptocurrencies' failure to scale beyond relatively nascent engineering is what makes it possible to consider the days early, since objectively it has already been a decade or more. However, even if this is just the beginning, and it very well might be, I'm not sure we should consider that any consolation. I think the opposite might be true. It seems like we should take notice that from the very beginning, these technologies immediately tended towards centralization through platforms in order for them to be realized. That this has zero negatively felt effect on the velocity of the system, and the most participants don't even know or care it's happening. This might suggest that decentralization itself is not actually of immediate, practical, or pressing importance to the majority of people downstream. That the only amount of decentralization people want is the minimum amount required for something to exist. And that if not very consciously accounted for, these forces will push us further from rather than closer to the ideal outcome 
as the days become less early. But you can't stop a gold rush. When you think about it, OpenSea would actually be much better in the immediate sense if all the Web3 parts were gone. It would be faster, cheaper for everyone, and easier to use. For example, to accept a bid on my NFT, I would have had to pay over $80 to $150 just in Ethereum transaction fees. That puts an artificial floor on all bids, since otherwise you'd lose money by accepting a bid for less than the gas fees. Payment fees by credit card, which typically feel extortionary, look cheap compared to that. OpenSea could even publish a simple transparency log if people wanted a public record of transactions, offers, bids, etc. to verify their accounting. However, if they had built a platform to buy and sell images that wasn't nominally based on crypto, I don't think it would have taken off. Not because it isn't distributed, because as we've seen, so much of what's required to make it work is already not distributed. I don't think it would have taken off because this is a gold rush. People have made money through cryptocurrency speculation. Those people are interested in spending that cryptocurrency in ways that support their investment while offering additional returns. And so that defines the setting for the market of transfer of wealth. The people at the end of the line who are flipping NFTs do not fundamentally care about distributed trust models or payment mechanics, but they care about where the money is. So the money draws people into OpenSea. They improve the experience by building a platform that iterates on the underlying Web3 protocols in Web2 space. They eventually offer the ability to mint NFTs through OpenSea itself instead of through your own smart contract. And eventually this all opens the door for Coinbase to offer access to the validated NFT market with their own platform via your debit card. That opens the door to Coinbase managing the tokens themselves through dark pools that Coinbase holds, which helpfully eliminates the transaction fees and makes it possible to avoid having to interact with smart contracts at all. Eventually, all the Web3 parts are gone and you have a website for buying and selling JPEGs with your debit card. The project can't start as a Web2 platform because of the market dynamics, but the same market dynamics and the fundamental forces of centralization will likely drive it to end up there. At the end of the stack, NFT artists are excited about this kind of progression because it means more speculation or investment in their art. But it also seems like if the point of Web3 is to avoid the trappings of Web2, we should be concerned that this is already the natural tendency for these new protocols that are supposed to offer a different future. I think these market forces will likely continue. And in my mind, the question of how long it continues is a question of whether the vast amounts of accumulated cryptocurrency are ultimately inside an engine or a leaky bucket. If the money flowing through NFTs ends up channeled back into crypto space, it could continue to accelerate forever, regardless of whether or not it's just Web 2 times 2. If it turns out, then this will be a blip. Personally, I think enough money has been made at this point that there are enough faucets to keep it going, and that it won't just be a blip. If that's the case, it seems worth thinking about how to avoid Web 3 being Web 2 times 2 as in Web2, but with even less privacy, with some urgency. Creativity might not be enough. I've only dipped my toe into the waters of Web3. Looking at it through the lens of these small projects, though, I can easily see why so many people find the Web3 ecosystem so neat. I don't think it's on a trajectory to deliver us from centralized platforms. I don't think it will fundamentally change our relationship to technology. And I think the privacy story is already below par for the internet, which is a pretty low bar. But I also understand why nerds like me are excited to build for it. It is at the very least something new on the nerd level, and that creates a space for creativity and exploration that is somewhat reminiscent of early days internet. Ironically, part of that creativity probably springs from the constraints that make Web3 so clunky. I'm hopeful that creativity and exploration we're seeing will have positive outcomes, but I'm not sure it's enough to prevent all the same dynamics of the internet from unfolding again. If we do want to change our relationship to technology, I think we'd have to do it intentionally. My basic thoughts are roughly, one, we should accept the premise that people will not run their own servers by designing systems that can distribute trust without having to distribute infrastructure. This means architecture that anticipates and accepts the inevitable outcome 
of relatively centralized client-server relationships, but uses cryptography rather than infrastructure to distribute trust. One of the surprising things to me about Web3, despite being built on crypto, is how little cryptography seems to be involved. Two, we should try to reduce the burden of building software. At this point, software projects require an enormous amount of human effort. Even relatively simple apps require a group of people to sit in front of a computer for eight hours a day, every day, forever. This hasn't always been the case. And there was a time when 50 people working on a software project wasn't considered a small team. As long as software requires such concerted energy and so much highly specialized human focus, I think it will have the tendency to serve the interests of the people sitting in that room every day rather than what we may consider our broader goals. I think changing our relationship to technology will probably require making software easier to create, but in my lifetime, I've seen the opposite come to pass. Unfortunately, I think distributed systems have a tendency to exacerbate this trend by making things more complicated and more difficult, not less complicated and less difficult. GM. Okay, so that was my first impressions of Web3 by Moxie, who is one of the co-founders of Signal. And I want to address some of the points, but what we'll do is first I want to summarize his main points, his main takeaways, um, and then I will go to Reddit where Vitalik Buterin offered a rebuttal post. I'll read that, um, and then I'll finally go into my own thoughts and leave my own view of what Web3 actually is, because I, spoiler alert, I think that Moxie's missing some of the aspects of Web3 and what makes it important in how he categorizes it. So that's what we'll do. Um, first, we'll start off with his main points. So Moxie's main points here are, he starts off with categorizing what Web1, Web2, and Web3 are, and that Web1 and 2 were about centralization of the web. Web1 started with distributed systems, Web2 went to centralizing it, and Web3 is about the same Web2, but decentralized. And for everything, kind of for money, for currency, for economics and art and games and everything that we're talking about, Web3, he gets that definition from a piece written by A16Z by Chris Dixon. And that the core of Web3 is really that decentralization of all of these aspects. And this, by the way, is where I think he's missing the main point, and that leads to the rest of his article being just a little bit off. It's well thought through, and he's played around with it and the APIs, uh, but I think there's there's a difference in the way, at least I view Web3 and the advantages it gives and also creating new industries, but also uh, giving us control over old industries, but more on that later. And the main reason for Web2 and for centralization and why Web1 didn't work is because People don't want to run their own servers, and protocols evolve slowly. They require coordination, and a centralized actor can move much faster. And so to see what Web3 was all about, he played around with it. And after checking it out, he found that Web3 is centralized. It's not decentralized. It's centralized through the same avenues of Web2, uh, mainly APIs. And this is the Infer API that checks the blockchain and gives back the state to many, many, many apps in the Web3 ecosystem, um, and OpenSea, which does the same thing for NFTs. So your MetaMask wallet that you think is checking the blockchain is actually not checking the blockchain, it's checking Infura. Infura servers, by the way, run, I think, predominantly on AWS. And so if anyone wanted to shut them down and got an executive order um, and serve that to Amazon, AWS could shut Infura down. And many of the Ethereum-focused apps including MetaMask, which is the you know leader in the market share in terms of wallet, would not work. Um, and so he's saying, hey, this is centralized. There are these points of centralization. They control the access to the blockchain. And they do that by virtue of centralization, which is they can iterate faster than the blockchain, than the protocol, offer a better user experience, whether that's for users or developers. And that's why people come to them and we're at the same point of web two, just we've added crypto. And even here, it's not even actual cryptography. It's just these you know coins and tokens. And so I think that's 
the main gist of his of his piece right web one was decentralization web two is centralization and here we are with web three back to the same old centralization and that's because people don't want to run their own servers and protocols move slower than centralized companies uh, and now i want to go over to vitalik's post on reddit and how he responds the word server in my opinion is not very useful in the blockchain context it combines together a bundle of concepts that are best treated separately particularly think of the following ways that a user could connect to the blockchain one they could use a binance account two they could run a piece of code that asks the infer api endpoint what the blockchain state is trust the answer however keys are still kept locally the code signs transactions locally and sends them to the infer api endpoint to be rebroadcasted three which is the same as two but the code also runs a light client to verify the signatures on the block headers and uses Merkle proofs to verify individual account and storage data. Four, the same as three, but the code talks to N different API endpoints run by N different companies. So only one of them need to be providing honest answers for the connection to be reliable. Five, the same as four, but instead of pre-specifying N API endpoints, the code connects directly to a peer-to-peer -peer network. Six, the same as five, but the code also does data availability sampling and accepts fraud proofs. So it can detect and refuse to accept blocks that are invalid. Seven, run a fully verifying node. And eight, run a fully verifying node that also participates in mining and staking. So what Vitalik just lays out here are different ways for a user to connect to the blockchain from kind of the most centralized approach, which is one, which is using a Binance account all the way to eight, running a fully verifying node that participates in mining and staking. And the eight options on the spectrum are laid out based on how much decentralization or centralization there is. So for example, in uh, state number four, you have a light client, which doesn't participate in mining or staking. It just participates in verifying that the nodes are true. Um, and it's still running through an API but it's not only checking the infer API, it's checking four or five different APIs, right? And therefore if infer uh, collapses, there are still other companies that can supply it. Now back to the post. Currently only option ones, two, seven, and eight are feasible. Uh, one and two are the Binance account or two is running a piece of code, basically the MetaMask wallet and seven and eight are running a full verifying node and participating in staking. So only the extremes are available today and seven and eight are too expensive for most users. Indeed, the whole reason why blockchains are the future of decentralization and self-hosting is not that running a server that stays online 24 seven is even harder than eight. If your staking node is only online 95% of the time, you're fine. If your website is only online 95% of the time, that presents a serious annoyance for the users. Moxie's critiques in the second half of the post strike me as having a correct criticism of the current state of the ecosystem, but they are missing where the ecosystem is going. There are already teams working on implementing three, four, and five, which are just a reminder the different kinds of light clients where you would verify different APIs and verify the blockchain yourself and active research on making six happen. Six is the code also does data availability sampling and accepts fraud proofs. So you're really engaged in verifying that the blockchain is correct. These efforts, contrary to Moxie's claim that there's little cryptography involved in crypto are heavily based on some of the most cutting edge and advanced cryptography out there. Verkle trees, ZK snarks of the Ethereum virtual machine, BLS signature aggregation, and so on. As for my theory about why this hasn't happened yet, I would say a lot of it comes down to limited technical resources and funding. It's easier to build things the lazy centralized way, and it takes serious effort to do it right. The Ethereum ecosystem did not have that much resources up until around four years ago. Of course, four years ago, the ecosystem did start to have a lot of resources, but new projects are slow to ramp up and the centralized workarounds have had years of a head start. One thing that makes the ramp up even slower is the chain of dependencies. 
In order to have light clients, we need to have a light client friendly chain, which is a deep change to the protocol. And so the only realistic opportunity to implement it is to switch to proof of stake. And we're only now at the point where we have the proof of stake and full integration with the merge is coming soon. Fortunately, the dependencies are being attacked and resolved one by one. There has already been a lot of progress. Once the general purpose hard legwork is done by a few dedicated teams, building trustless applications will become much more feasible for all dev teams. And that would just need to plug in the libraries. So I think the properly authenticated decentralized blockchain world is coming and is much closer to being here than many people think. Of course, it's always possible that all this tech will get built and many people will not care, but I'm more optimistic. Users generally accept defaults given by developers and many developers really do genuinely care about decentralization and trustlessness and growing legal issues refunding centralized points of trust will push them to care more. Decentralized options that users reject today, like running a full node, really are quite difficult today. So it's understandable that users are sticking to the more centralized options that at least they can easily use. None of the proposals outlined here are anywhere remotely as difficult and even running a full node itself will get easier and cheaper over time as ideas like statelessness and history expiry come into play. So I see no technical reason why the future needs to look like the status quo today. So that's Vitalik's response. And if I had to summarize that, it would be two things. It would be one, yes, the current state today isn't ideal, but there are ways that the Ethereum Foundation or different client teams have on their roadmap to get to a more decentralized vision of the ecosystem in the future. And it's not kind of pie in the sky, it's actually very concrete, but unfortunately, this is a process that some steps have to have to happen first. And the Ethereum teams have uh, kind of the Ethereum foundation has had a very, very slow, if you wanted to look at it on a startup level, they had a very slow ramp up time from 2015 through kind of 2018, 2019. And in that sense, Moxie is completely correct. Startups or centralized companies definitely work faster than protocols. Um, but here, I think the main takeaway from Vitalik's response is that there is a roadmap ahead. It does solve the issues that Moxie is raising, um, and we're going to get there. I had a few other points that I wanted to bring up um, regarding decentralization. And it's that decentralization is a spectrum. We like to think about it as binary. You're either decentralized or you are centralized, but that's not how I think it actually plays out. The option to exit the system, even if it's marginal, has much more clout than we think. That is to say that in a system where even 95 or 98 percent of the system runs on completely centralized infrastructure, the 2 percent that gives the exit ramp, the off ramp, is much more powerful than we imagine and really affects the entire system. Uh, take, for example, a bank run, right? A bank run happens very, very rarely, but in a world where bank runs are possible and people can actually withdraw their money, those bank runs affect the way the entire bank system is run every single day because banks know that customers can come and pull their money out in a time of great distress. Today, by the way, that's not so possible with a lot of government regulation, but the same, by the way, exists in competition. The difference between a complete monopoly and having two competitors is very, very different. Um, even if one of those competitors is relatively small, having Lyft in a market with Uber completely changed the picture for Uber. And I think the same is true in the Web3 world. Even with the centralization that Infura brings, even with the centralization that OpenSea brings, you still have the option to engage with the blockchain directly. It's harder. It's more on you know the extreme edges of people who have the technical capabilities to do it and build it, but it exists. The keys are still your own. The tokens are still your, yours. The NFTs are still yours. You control access to it. It's your secret key. 
And that ability at the end of the day is everything because if MetaMask or Infura or OpenSea became centralized and people didn't want to interact with them, they have the option to do something else. And in my mind, that is the key. That's the most important part. If we look at the existing financial system, that option doesn't exist. You have no off-ramp if the government decides something, if other countries decide something. There is no off-ramp. You don't control. And with the blockchain, even though it is centralized today, you have that option. And in my mind, that matters to, to everything. And that's what everyone has in the back of their mind when they think about these systems. They know that at the end of the day, someone can simply fork their protocol or withdraw or engage with a blockchain directly. And as long as the blockchain itself is distributed and is decentralized, that's what matters. The other part that I think is coming into play here in the sense of its early days, yeah, crypto has been around for 10 plus years already. Ethereum arguably has only been around for seven. Um, of those seven, it's only been mainstream for four. Um, through that time, it's been a crypto winter and there just haven't been the same amount of developers working on it. I think now we're really at the tipping point where we have enough people working on Ethereum, on the Web3 ecosystem, that these excuses, you know, in two years, we can't give these excuses anymore because we have the critical mass. But in the early days of any technological change, what we see is integration across the ecosystem. In the early days of the mainframe, you had companies that did it all, right? IBM did, that was, that's why it was the mainframe. They, they did the hardware, they did the software, they did the, the go-to-market, they did everything because integration provides benefits early on. As ecosystems evolve and APIs exist and specialization occurs, that's when modularization in the value chain happens. Um, that's what we see today in the PC ecosystem where Taiwan Semiconductors is going to be doing the chips and Windows does the operating system, but HP does the actual manufacturing and the distribution goes through someone else. That's the modularization of the value chain. And today, in many ways, we're still in the integration phase of the blockchain ecosystem. You still only have a few APIs um, that are used by everyone. You still only have a few dominant players like MetaMask or Uniswap for currency exchange. Like there, It is still a very much centralized ecosystem just because it hasn't evolved enough. I would expect that as time goes on, that integrated value chain becomes modularized and different API players come to compete with Infura and with OpenSea. And in fact, we're seeing part of that play out today. So today there's Alchemy that competes with Infura and in a few years, we'll probably have another company that does that. And in terms of the cryptography and uh, gas fees, I mean, if you guys have been listening, you know that things are changing here, right? We have uh, cryptography and privacy with zero knowledge proofs. Starkware this week just processed more transactions than the Ethereum main chain, which is amazing and crazy. Arbitrum Optimism are bringing fees down. Like we're, we're getting there. We're getting there much faster than people are aware of because this is not yet mainstream. You have to be pretty far down the crypto rabbit hole. You have to be listening to this podcast to know that, but we're getting there. And so this is the kind of integration versus modularization that I think is happening and will prove or kind of will disprove Moxie's thesis that everything is going to be centralized because that's what moves faster. There is no doubt in my mind that a centralized company moves faster than a protocol, but for an ecosystem, there is a huge, huge value in having an open protocol because people can innovate on top of that. And that is a large benefit that an open decentralized platform offers, right? Uniswap cannot exist on a closed web and Uniswap enables so many different games, applications, everything, because now you can trade in and out of, of any currency. Um, and it's not only Uniswap, right? It's any automated market maker. And so that's the advantage where you can move quickly on an open protocol. So those were my thoughts on what I think Moxie's specifically missing here. Um, next week, we'll be reading one last piece on Web3 
and I will also be offering kind of my own take on what Web3 is. And I think it's slightly different than how Moxie defined it here, but this is a great piece. It's really well worth reading, especially if you're not aware of how centralized those APIs actually are and how much they affect the Web3 and the Ethereum ecosystem. So definitely, definitely well worth reading for that. And the rebuttal by Vitalik. Hope you enjoyed it. See you next week.